Someone must have traduced Joseph K, for without having done anything wrong, he was arrested one fine morning. These are the lines that open the novel of Franz Kafka called The Trial. And uh, this is a beautiful portrayal of the phenomena of human guilt. Joseph K is arrested and he doesn't know why. And in many ways, people live their lives feeling guilty about many things, feeling guilty because they're not guilty sometimes. And guilt is a great enemy of the healthy ego and the healthy personality, although a sense of guilt is important for human beings to have. But it's a question of proportionality. It's a question of having the capacity for guilt rather than feeling guilty all the time. Now, what we have been doing in this series called the eight stages of man-woman, the eight stages of human personality development, is looking at the journey of all of our lives and looking at it from the point of view of what constitutes a healthy personality. What, what is it that makes for, in the stages along the way, the ingredients that will form a healthy personality? Let's say the goal, although it will be individualized and idiosynchronized by each person, the goal would be self-acceptance, that I accept myself, I have a sense of identity, a sense of ego boundary, I know who I am, I know what I can do, I know what I want to do, I know what my limits are, I have a sense of personal power, I have a sense of my own creativity, I am response-able. All of those things constitute healthy personality. And what we began with a couple of weeks ago is looking at the stages along the way. And I'm inviting you to go on a journey with me and go back like an archaeologist or a historian and look at your own pasts. Not so much to stay back there and not so much to inquire, acquire more guilt about how you're raising your kids or whatever, but more in terms of your own personality, to see how you were with those stages and above all to realize that it can all be changed. Now we're talking now, we've come now to the third developmental stage. The first night, we, the, the second night we talked about trust versus mistrust and this inherent quality that e Eric Erickson calls ego strength, an ego strength which we need to develop because we're not instinctually determined like the other orders of nature. And the ego strength that comes out of the first developmental crisis, because every stage is characterized by a crisis, and I've really made the point in these first two programs that life is characterized by crisis. And to me, that's terribly important. That good, healthy growth means dying, saying goodbye, being a little bit depressed because you have to leave one stage and going on to the next. The crisis of trust versus mistrust and the ego strength is hope. And then we also talked about autonomy, 15 months to three years versus shame and doubt. Little kid beginning to locomote and beginning to get muscles, holding on, letting go. And the ego strength that emerges is willpower. So if we think of identity as the midpoint in the development of a healthy ego, then what we've seen so far is I am what I am given or the incorporative stage, the first stage of life. I can trust the world. I can make something out of myself because I can trust the world. Mama was there when I needed her. The bottle was there when I needed it. Someone was there to comfort me. The facts are friendly. The world is friendly. I am what I will. My little kid now has this polarity between autonomy versus shame and doubt. 
I am what I will. I am what I'm given. I am what I will. Now we come to the third stage from about three years old to six or seven where the issue is initiative versus guilt. And initiative means a sense of I can trust the world, I can trust myself. Now what kind of person am I? And the ego strength that emerges here is purpose. That I can envision myself being a person in this world, a man or a woman. Freud called this the Oedipal phase, and he thought of this as involving sexual identity. Now, I don't think it only involves sexual identity, although that's one of the factors in it. And, un, you know, getting a sense of my own sexuality. One of the things that's important in this stage to understand is what Erickson calls the intrusive mode. Little kids begin to locomote now. They can walk, they've interiorized gravity without worrying about it. So they're not sort of tiptoeing around. They're really able to go, they're able to locomote. And so the modality of their life during this period is intrusive. They intrude into your ears with excessive talking because by three or four, language is being acquired. So language and locomotion, they intrude into your ears with excessive talking, a lot of factual questions, asking questions, asking questions, asking questions, asking questions. Also, though, they intrude into your space just with their locomotive energy, but there's also the sense of intruding in the sense of exploring the unknown. And part of the unknown is exploring their bodies. So out of locomotion and language comes imagination. <clears throat> lots of imagination, lots of fantasy during this period. A lot of people believe that what Freud often found in his patients when they talked about the Oedipal complex, the desire to have their mother sexually or whatever ways they experience that, that he called the Oedipal conflict, Many, many researchers now believe that that was basically fantasy. It was an interpretive fantasy that the person was having. It didn't really happen. And uh, personally, I think that uh, the, all the details of the so-called Oedipal drama are just too far out to be, to be entertained, especially when you understand how children think in this period. Now, it's important to understand that children are cognitive aliens. That's the best way I know how to say it. That in this period, from about two and a half to seven or eight, kids don't think like, like adults do. Their thinking is characterized by what Piaget calls pre-operational thought. And what that means is that their thinking is non-logical. It's magical. Here's magical thinking. Step on a crack, you break your mother's back. There may be something to that. No, no, no just, just kidding. You, you step on a crack, you break your mother's back. It's sort of like if I do an action, I can make something happen. Here's an example of magic. Little Farquhar asks mother for something for Christmas. No, he wants a little red wagon. Mother says, wait till Christmas. How many days till Christmas? 221. So he starts checking it off. He waits and waits and waits and waits. And Christmas morning, there it is. Guess what he concludes? He's non-logical. Waiting works. If you wait, you can make things happen. That's magic. See, magic is if I do a gesture, I can make something happen. A lot of kids think if they close their eyes in this period, everything disappears. I can remember seeing a little boy going to the bathroom on the side of the road on a highway with his eyes closed. <laughs> See, if I close my eyes, then everything else goes away. And that's magic. Uh, Piaget, who is a researcher into the developmental stages of children, and interestingly enough, Piaget found stages too that, that we all went through in terms of thinking. And he's the one I'm using as my source for this that the thinking from two and a half to six years or six or seven years old is magical, egocentric, non-logical, animistic, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger too. See, animals have the same kind of motivation as we do. Egocentric, if I have it, you have it. 
Try it with your three-year-olds or four-years-old. If they know their right hand and their left hand, have them stand across from you and ask them, which is your right hand? And they'll go, that one. That is, the one that corresponds to my right hand. Now, that kind of egocentrism is not moral egocentrism. It's not being bad. It's the inability to differentiate between subject and object. You see, it takes us a long time to develop the mind so that we can do what approximates what we call logical, objective, deductive reasoning. And in this period, a child's mind is transductive. For example, I heard a kid say, the moon doesn't fall because there is no sun because it's very high. You see, see the transductive reasoning? It's like putting three facts together. It's not causally related. Someone compared a child's mind from three to six and a half like a slide projector, and then at six and a half or seven, it becomes like a moving picture. But it's a slide projector. Later on, at about five or six, you'll get things like this. Can you be an American and a Protestant at the same time? Little kid told me one day, not unless you go home. Now, I don't know what that means. Can, can, can you show a five-year-old wooden beads and white beads, and he can understand that they can be wooden, but he can't grasp that they can be wooden and white simultaneously because his mind goes, ch -ch 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 -ch. it's like picture, 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 picture. Now, what's the point of telling you all of this? Realistic, the, the uh, little kids four and five years old are asked, about dreams. Where do dreams come from? They say, in through the window. It's very concrete, literal. So, if the mind is like that, suppose you have a fantasy that some adult says is bad. You've made it happen by thinking it. See the magic? This is where the guilt comes from. And it's why Kafka, when he writes the trial, is so right on. See. It may be what we've ascribed original sin to, that we feel guilty before we know why. And many times people do that and, and go way back, I've always felt bad about myself. Because a lot of the fantasizing of this period is magical. If I think it, I make it happen. Say the magic words, think the magic words, and it happens. So a great deal of the dynamics of this period are the relationship with the parents and the role model of the parents, because a little person now is really watching the parents. And, and the way mom and daddy relate to this child becomes very important. Now, let me give you an example. You go home, you're tired, you're hungry, and your, your child is there, and they're pulling on you, and they're bugging you, and uh, you love them, and you're a good person, and you say, quit bothering me. Or you say, quit being such a nuisance. And remember what we said the first program about cradle hypnosis, that words are hypnotic. Words become magic. So here's a little person, instead of saying, I'm tired, I'm frustrated, I had a bad day, I have this toxic person I work with, and she, he, she bugged me all day today, we say, quit being a nuisance. Kid doesn't know what nuisance is, but it doesn't sound good, <laughs> okay? Or worse, we say, quit being so selfish or quit being so bad. And those words come in with the force of magical power and begin to form the conscience of the child. Freud talked about the harsh superego, this harsh kind of censor in us. So you don't have to do too much during this period to get kids pretty uptight and self-restraining and self-doubting and self-condemning. And of course, few of us have had much education about this. Few of us have had, you know, any training instead of, you know, for a, what, what do you need for a marriage? A blood test. Till death do you part for 60 years. No, we should be getting education about the developmental stages of children and communication techniques and how to use I messages. I feel frustrated instead of you are a nuisance. See, because if I, th this is the dynamic. When I walk in here and I feel uncomfortable, the most, the most powerful dynamic of my life is to blame you for it. If you were all sitting here with red feathers in your hair and little funny radar sounds coming out of your ears, 
Let's say you were in a red feather radar club. Uh, but I didn't know it. And I walked in here, I'd feel uncomfortable when I looked at you. Now, what I tend to do when I feel uncomfortable is in my head go, boy, these people are weird. See, I blame you for my discomfort. Instead of saying, I feel uncomfortable, I don't have any radar equipment or a red feather. If a Martian were looking in, he'd be saying, who's the banana without a feather? I mean, I would be the one sticking out. But in order to give meaning to myself so that I believe I'm not crazy, because I got no red feather or radar, what I say is you are weird. Now, when I come home tired and hungry and lonely and have a bad day, it's very difficult for me to remember to communicate by staying with self-responsible statements. And depending on the age of the child you're in a relating with, it's the impossible possibility that anybody come out of childhood without feeling guilty, without having some guilt laid on them, without having some judgment put on them or some criticism put on them. And I'm not blaming, not blaming my parents. And please don't blame yourselves. If you think this makes sense, we'll then make a decision to begin to do it. Stay within your own body. You see, there are other things that begin to happen. Because the child here then is exploring the world, trying to identify, I, I know I can trust the world, I can trust myself, what kind of person am I? There's mama, there's daddy, I want to be like them. And probably nothing is more important here than the relationship between the mother and daddy or the mental health of the mother and daddy. In terms of the dynamics of childhood, nothing is more important than that. If, if this mother loves her husband, if this husband loves his wife, then the little boy and girl who have to wean themselves away from mother or the little boy who has to wean himself from mother and identify with daddy is going to want to be like daddy because mother loves him so much. You see, in the dynamic of the so-called Oedipal deal is much more to understandable to me just in terms of the health of the relationship in the marriage. Now, let's take sexual issues. The little kid is locomoting, getting in the closets, looking around, catching people in bathrooms. Little kid's got language and fantasy, and it's exploring his or her body. And you've all heard me go through my little routine about one day he finds his ear, and he can name it, because now he's got language, he can name things, ear. And see, kids love to talk once. It's almost like when you learn to ride a bicycle, you keep doing it over and over again. Well, when you learn language, you keep saying it over and over again. When you learn you can ask questions, you just ask questions over and over again. So little Farquhar finds his ear and everybody freaks out. Then he finds his nose and they even call relatives over. The relatives come over and say, let me see your nose. And he goes, any normal kid is going to start finding other stuff. <laughs> and a drama is coming where one day everyone is sitting in the living room and here comes little Farquhar with his new find. <laughs> it's the best thing he ever found. It's better than his ear. It's better than his nose. He has found his genitals and he wants to point them out to everybody. <laughs> Well, depending on where mom and daddy and grandma and grandpa are with their own sexuality, when that little dude hits that room and begins to show himself or herself off, the family's going to go. <laughs> and what kind of a message is that? Everything else has been great, man. The ear got applause. This feels a lot better than the ear and everybody turn their heads and nobody will talk to me. <laughs> See the confusion and we think, you know, people are parading around about sex education in schools. My God, it's already happened by four years old. You've already gotten the messages about your body and sexuality. You've already gotten the sense of guilt about it. We wonder where this comes from. It's already being programmed in. Now, I'm not saying we should take pictures and cast them in bronze at this point but it seems like it's very important to affirm and understand that this child is magical. So when you make that prohibitive, there is, it's almost like a sense that magically for the rest of his or her life, there's gonna be some consternation with this part of the body and this phenomena of human sexuality. And it, it then becomes secretive and illicit. So we have a billion dollar movie industry and girly book industry and all of that, and we wonder why because it's dead ringer comes right out of the programming. And the guilt issue, 
is, is a very big one here because if the proportion of initiative, I'm okay, my body's okay, I can accept myself, I can accept every part of me. See, self-acceptance, a strong ego, is accepting every part of me. If I can't accept every part of me, if all these parts of me are bad or wrong, then I become split with the guilt. The guilt becomes a split within me. Now, people, you know, think about it. Uh, I can think of, uh, you know, being guilty a great deal of my life. I can think of feeling guilty and not even knowing why at times. I'm not saying that there isn't a sense of guilt which is healthy. We talk about sociopathic or psychopathic personalities that have no sense of guilt, no sense of responsibility. The question here is a proportion. If I feel pretty good about myself, I can trust the world, I can trust myself, then I am what I am given with the resources of the world. I am what I will, and now I am what I imagine that I can be. I set my sight on the stars. I want to be like my daddy. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a mama. I want to have kids. I want to have a family. I want to have a career. So children at this stage begin to make initial choices about their life identity. And if there's too much guilt here, then the script gets very much dominated by internal strife and internal alienation and internal judgment. I'm not okay. I'm not okay. There's something wrong with me. And then an over-rigid self-control coming to the point of compulsivity. So here's an exercise you can do that's a very important one. And, and I don't think we have time really to go into it, but at your leisure, those of you that are home watching, take 15 minutes one day and sit down and close your eyes and imagine that you see yourself sitting across from you and start a process of criticizing yourself. And after you do that for a couple of minutes until you really start feeling it, then become yourself and start answering the criticism and do that for a couple of minutes, then become the critic again for a couple of minutes, then become yourself again for a couple of minutes, and do that for about 15 minutes. Generally what happens is you will actually begin to hear somebody's voice in there. See, because again, depending on whether mom and daddy were firm but tolerant, were democratic rather than autocratic or permissive, those messages in your head can be very critical and very powerful. You can be at war with yourself by tapes in your head that you don't even remember the source of. Once you've done that, write down the dominant criticisms. Get it out on a piece of paper and write them down. I am selfish or uh, I am uh, unambitious or I am jealous or I'm never going to amount to anything. Whatever the messages are that you pick up in there, and then let's take one like I am selfish. Go back as far back as you can to where you first heard that about yourself and find out what the concrete specific behavior was. Like I didn't want to do the dishes. Or I didn't want to give my brother some of my candy. See, because nine times out of 10, it's mother feels frustrated, the two kids are fighting, and mother says, you kids are very selfish. Now, mama doesn't mean any harm by that, or daddy doesn't mean any harm by that, or whoever the adult doesn't is doing it, but nonetheless, the judgment is being put on the people. And so what you have to do for yourself is translate it back into, I didn't want to do the dishes. And then what I say there, and that's okay because nobody wants to do dishes. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to share my candy, and that's okay because candy's good, and I was only four years old, and I liked candy. Uh, you see, in other words, you've got to get this cleared up if you're going to have self-unification and self-acceptance. We've said all along here that the most important thing in life is inner unity. If you want to have personal power, you've got to have inner unity. And that inner unity can only come from total self-acceptance. Now, I don't know what religions anybody is here tonight or watching the program, but almost all the religions offer salvation. And salvation comes from a Latin word, salus, which means oneness or wholeness. You see, and, and really the impact of religion is to tell you 
that you're lovable and that you're accepted and that you're forgiven and that it's okay. You see, and the whole point then is to realize that I am unique, that I have the possibility of owning myself, even now, even now if you're filled with guilt, it's okay. Go back, look at it, translate it back into the specifics. You are good. God made the world and he saw it was good. You're good people. And it's just terrible, the pain and toll of criticism and judgment. And every researcher from psychologist to the great psychotherapy in the Bible says that the worst thing that happens to all of us is judgment and criticism. Franz Kafka's novel that I started with, The Trial, is a beautiful story of a man who's bewildered because one day he's arrested and he doesn't know what he did. And that is the story of all of us to some degree. And it doesn't do you any good to sit there criticizing and hating and judging yourself. You've got to stop that and accept yourself just as you are. See, what's at, at stake in all of this is every one of our uniquenesses. Because once, once I'm criticizing myself, I become threatened and uptight. And then I become defensive. I either live my life in fight, angry, hostile, or withdrawal, conforming, letting everybody kick me around. You've got to get the inner right before you can get the outer right. Now, the kingdom of heaven is within. That is, our life drama has to be worked out first within before it can get worked out without. So every one of us have the possibility of changing. You can change those guilt-ridden consciences if you want to. What's at stake here, you see, is you. Everything can be different than it is. That is our great hope. You can change the choice is yours.